unedited, but hopefully you heard all of that. Uh, carrying on, if you're not already involved in Warwick AI before we start, I'd like to urge you to check the links down below and take part. We run workshops and classes that teach practical skills and offer guidance for starting up your own AI-based projects. We have a careers team that will help you find work in what I consider to be one of the most exciting and future-proof industries. We also host events with academics and professionals who are using artificial intelligence to revolutionize the way the work is done in their area. Um, just in case you didn't catch the beginning of that, I wanted to let you know that Warwick AI's Summit is a series of talks and workshops that are on a wide range of topics that share the common theme of machine intelligence. Um, we want to talk here about the conflicts, applications and implications of uh, machine, introducing machine intelligence into our world. The aim of the summit here is to draw attention to the pace at which AI is rapidly changing the world in which we live and to broach the difficult and exciting questions and prospects that are arising, all in an attempt to cultivate more discussion and thought among the next generation of researchers and consumers of AI. So today we have Asma talking about kickstarting successful AI projects. Um, but after this talk, at four o'clock, we have fundamental AI research from DeepMind. So make sure that you check out the links in the description for that one. So moving on to today's talk, there's a few things I want to mention before I introduce our speaker. The first thing, uh, very important, is that we're giving away a lot of merch over this summit. So if you're interested in winning hoodies, um, MATLAB merch, Amazon Echoes, then ask questions in the chat and you'll have a good chance of getting your hands on some stuff. We'll uh, pick our favorites and we'll get in touch with you. So the second point I want to make is that this event is in collaboration with another society, and that's Work Entrepreneurship Society. So before I introduce Asma, I want to quickly pass over to Andre from Work Entrepreneurs, who's going to give a little introduction uh, to his society. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're really excited. We at Work Entrepreneurs are really excited to hear from Asma today. Uh, while we don't know much about uh, artificial intelligence at Work Entrepreneurs, we're always willing to learn, and um, especially from the best in the field as Asma is today. Uh, to talk a bit about our society, we're a student society and we're centered around entrepreneurship and taking initiative. We run numerous workshops and events. Uh, we've already had two this term with three more coming up. Um, and we pride ourselves on the fact that we encourage our members to develop their own projects, even if they're just starting out with us. Uh, we're really looking forward to this event and we hope that we will collaborate again in the future as collaboration is what drives innovation. Fantastic, Thank Andre. Thank you so much. So let's get on to the reason we're all here, which is Asma Ibrahim. She's a specialist in system engineering, cloud computing and cognitive computing. And she has a wealth of experience working with large companies, governments and startups. For over four years, Asma has been working at Vodafone, where she's worked on their AI and machine learning solutions. Over the last year, she's been working as the product owner for one of Vodafone's AI-based digital solutions, overseeing a development team. Her workshop today will overview design thinking. How can you dissect and optimize the development of a project? How can you define, analyze, prototype, and test the solution to a problem? Asma will be discussing all of this with reference to an AI case study. So without further ado, I want to hand over to Asma. Welcome, Asma. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you, actually, Joe, for this amazing introduction. Um, thank you for your invitation, definitely. Um, so I will start directly in our uh, one hour presentation. I will give you the procedure about the one and a half hour, uh, what I'm going to cover today, and how we can all of us get the most benefit from it. So you can say uh, the presentation is called Design for AI. Okay, so what's the relationship between design and AI? Is there something like uh, common between design thinking and AI? Is there a link or something like this? Let's see together. So I will give you um, an introduction about AI. 
what is artificial intelligence. And you will tell me actually, because everyone now do even research, looking for a job or even do some development that's related to machine learning and AI. And you do COVID-19, all of us see how much uh, the market has been uh, transformed to consume the digital application and how much ML technology fostered this actual transformation. Let's see. So I, I'm waiting you to tell me what is uh, the definition of artificial intelligence from your perspective. What are the common application that's contained actually AI technology now? Are we using them or not? So then we will talk about, okay, AI application is an application. So is there a way or process to develop it? So what are the life cycle of AI based application development? Then we will see what the link actually between design thinking and AI application development life cycle. So we have one hour. You will hear too much and you will, you will hear my voice too much. My beats a little bit noisy. I do not know. And you can, you feel free to ask me whatever you want. And I will check your question during the talk to adjust, to tweak the talk to map it uh, with your expectation. And you have half an hour to ask whatever you want. And let's make it like a discussion or conversation more than uh, Q and A. So let's start and hear your turn. I will ask you guys what is machine, what is AI, what is artificial intelligence. I see a lot of audience. I see Frank, Andrew. Uh, so I expect someone to tell me what is the definition of artificial intelligence from your perspective. Hello. I'm waiting. I will give you one minute. There will be a delay uh, in the the fact that uh, there's a 30 yeah. second delay on the stream. So they'll see, they'll hear your question, and they'll uh, they'll be answering in the chat in about 30 seconds or so. So um, in the meantime, I can give you my interpretation of artificial intelligence. Uh, <laughs> machine intelligence is cognitive processes that are taking place in like a machine substrate rather than a, a, a biological substrate. So any sort of process that you do in everyday life can be broken down into a subset of, of sort of decisions and representing that sort of knowledge in a machine system and then making those decisions um, in a machine substrate is kind of kind of the, the basic of basics of it. Um, where you draw the line between sort of consciousness and machine intelligence is difficult, but it looks like we got somebody in the chat. Uh, so I don't know if you can see that one, Asma. Yeah, opinion. I can see OG, but yeah, you have nailed it by the way, though, and I will uh, people have mentioned by OG, the theory and development of computer system able to perform tasks normally requiring requiring human intelligence, such as visual per, uh, perception, speech recognition, decision making. And you can say this like, okay, uh, the best answer you can get it on a question like this in a talk, to be honest. So let me share with you my simple, actually, definition of AI. Uh, yeah, you will say that artificial intelligence is an era of computer science to emphasize the creation of intelligent machine that capable to work and react like human, as you have mentioned. Um, some of this activity could be learning, planning, do problem solving, decision making, even speech like a human or do image recognition, image detection. So it's like, imit okay, you can say imitate the human capability. So we have a brain and we have this kind of sensor like eye, talk, like tongue using for talking, like our hands to catch things you can sense using your hands and so on. This, this will move us to the next slide, which talking more about, okay, cool, AI, yeah, it's like, Technology. So what about machine learning, natural language processing, and computer vision? To have all this capability, you need to have a set of algorithms. Algorithms such as machine learning. So when we talk about machine learning, it's at the sign. Such as imitating the brain actually capability. And when we talk about natural language processing, here we talk about the language part. So is a machine capable to talk like a human? Yeah, you will see a lot of chatbots now like Siri or um, Google Assistant. They are based on uh, this set of algorithms. We have another set of algorithms called computer vision, and this related to more about 
the processing of images such as, as I have mentioned, image recognition, image detection or object detection, image, image processing and so on. So you can summarize that AI technology includes a set of algorithms such as machine learning, natural language processing and computer vision. You can see it like a high level summary of the technology under the big umbrella of artificial intelligence. So the next question from my side, to be honest, how many applications that we are using now is based on AI? So Joe, as you are um, the one who Amazing. And in our even normal people who are not came from computer science, they don't even know what is AI, they are actually using uh, machine learning or AI based applications such as traffic alert system that came from Google Map. How many people are using Google Map now? Google I, Maps, traffic I was, routing. I was just uh, muted when I said that, but I basically said that every single company, uh, most of the big tech companies, um, they, such as Facebook, Apple, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, IBM, and then all of the companies in China, Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, they're all massively utilizing AI. Uh, so, and, and as, as Mark's talking about now, Google uh, and their, their routing systems. But yeah, yeah. Car carry on, Asma, yeah. sorry about that. Thank you. No, please go ahead, Joe, because you have actually nailed it. So traffic alert system that came, okay, let's see how much ha Google map ha ha has been enhanced since two years, two years, then they have applied machine learning, you will, you, will, you will feel actually the significant enhancement in the Google Maps features, such, such as the best shouting and all of this stuff came due to using machine learning. Social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, my goodness, profiling, uh, the recommendation engine behind this uh, solution. Uh, profile matching, uh, you can say how much is the ads capability of this platform has been enhanced using machine learning. Okay, when you just post a photo of your friend and you start, oh my goodness, how how this application could detect or tag this friend by using this computer vision based uh, algorithm. As we have mentioned, set of algorithm, you can integrate them in your application to enhance the customer experience, even minimize the cost or achieve revenues as we are seeing now. i check if you open some solution like Salesforce, you start to put like a keyword, how much the application is capable actually to correct the word for you. How much Microsoft Office, Microsoft Word, when you are using it now, you will feel how much has been enhanced. You can see now when you write an email via Google, Gmail, it's, it, it, oh my goodness, it's doing, uh, how I can say it, it does actually autocomplete and uh, sometimes you feel, oh my goodness, uh, Google is writing the email for me. It's really crazy thing. What else? Search, search engine, how much Google search engine has been enhanced using machine learning capability? What else? Sentiment analysis, one of the biggest, uh, era in applying natural language processing algorithms. You can in, enhance the reviewing module on top of, of uh, website, so you can detect how much the customer is happy or not using sentiment analysis. Virtual personal assistant, we see now Terry and Alex and all of this stuff, how they are clever now to give you what you want when you are talking with Terry or Alexa or Google Assistant, all of them based on a set of machine learning or NLB or computer vision algorithms. So you can feel it. We have actually a lot of AI based application. You will find it in YouTube, how much YouTube recommendation engine has been enhanced in the couple. Uh, yeah, you can see. You, you can just watch this video 
oh my goodness, you find a sick next video, it's mapped with what you have started. But you can protect yourself by, by the way to prevent this application from storing your data. So, as you know, the technology has a good and bad side, but you need to be um, the one who using it, using it for good actually things. Would you recommend, a, would you recommend, Asma, that people do protect their data, or do you not think that their lives are improved by the fact that they're giving more data to Spotify so that they can get recommended better music, and, and uh, Netflix is rec making better recommendations because they have our data? Does it matter that we're giving away this data to these companies? Actually, it's a really very good question. It depends how much you are care about your uh, personal data, if you get what I mean. So, for example, um, I feel frustrated sometimes about some social media application. I don't like to keep track. I don't. I don't like to save my location. I see it's not good from how, how I can say it from privacy perspective. But if if you put if I put myself in the company side or in the enterprise side, we'll see. Oh, it's good to enhance the technology itself. But there is a good different ways to do this. I'm not sure if you have uh, uh, seen the application which is called CrowdSource. This has been published by uh, by Google. They try to get the customer feedback on top of their uh, application to enhance the machine learning capability behind this application. So I see it's a good way uh, to collect data, if you get what I mean. So sometimes you need to be careful. And uh, not all of application you should use it. But if you use this application like Netflix and YouTube and give you uh, gives you a benefit, I assume you can. Oh, okay. I share this information um to pay for getting this benefit not sure if i have answered your question or not joe but sure. really different angles you can see this answer image classification like predicting is it a human or is it something of like a cat dog probe and so on this based on computer vision application but let's agree if there is like a kind of categories of ai we are not in the super intelligence uh era yet but we have achieved what is called artificial narrow intelligence. You will, fee, you will see actually this kind of prediction, recommendation engine, self-driven car, even that intelligent chatbots, and all of this, all of this stuff has been have been validated or proved from the technology perspective and from industry perspective too. In artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, the one is related to Sophie robot, and oh my goodness. You can imagine if the if the machine becomes self-aware, the point that you have uh, mentioned uh, mentioned it, uh, Joe, at the beginning. How much do you feel if the machines start to be self-aware about their capability and so on? So we have this kind of Sufi robot. You they try to achieve what is called artificial general intelligence. About artificial super intelligence, the machine or the software that that is capable to do beyond okay the human can do we we are not yet from the industry perspective i'm not talking from research perspective because i'm sure from academia there is a lot of trials now regarding this aspect even the machine consciousness and all of this stuff you'll find a lot of japanese company or startups focusing in this era if you are interested about them joe okay we have mentioned at the beginning the ai application is an application so I want to go, ah, okay, I don't like to visit this uh, slide at the beginning, but it's okay, I want to ask people. So what is the difference between traditional application and AI-based application? I think that the AI application, it has to, and this is from an uh, entrepreneur's point of view, not a computer programmer, but the AI application has to continuously improve itself and to learn from its users other like in comparison to a traditional application where a human has to interpret the statistics and to interpret the um to interpret how to make changes for the users whereas the artificial intelligence application can make those changes by itself yeah it's another actual side thank you andrea yeah definitely so you are talking here about data such as having like a kid you are trying to learn them the learning uh, process never ever will stop you keep learn your kid about what's new you give them data and all of this stuff so it's, a, it's about data as much as you have an accurate and proper data you can build a proper model and this will touch the job question which is oh, okay should we give this data for companies to enhance their models or what so it's like two yeah two sides 
question. So if you didn't, you will lose the value and benefit from it. If you did, it might harm your data privacy or something like this. So you need to measure it. It's like win-win situation, if you get what I mean. On the topic of uh, the data issue, Abdullah in the chat wants to know that is the danger that in the future some tyrannical government, if they get hold of your data, they can use it against you. Uh, for example, the CCP at the moment in China, who's expanding their sort of artificial intelligence outreach, uh, especially with the things like the Belt and Road Initiative, where they're sort of uh, pushing their police surveillance AI into 70 countries in, in uh, Central Asia and Africa. Uh, could they not use that sort of use AI to control the people? Um, this national ID system uh, is, is a great example. Is that a threat or is that not really an issue? Actually, it's a, it's a threat. Okay, uh, it's a threat. Let's agree on this. It's, there is no security in this world 100%. But as I told you, if you didn't cope with this technology, you will lose. And if you have coped with it, you will lose. But how much you will lose? So you need to calculate it. At the same time, there is kind of regulatory and this laws start to appear, what's called AI for good and so, uh, and all of this stuff. Beside this, the customer is the controller. If you, okay, let me share with you some cases. If X big company has violated some data rules, what will happen? She will lose, it will lose actually the, the reputation. So you are the controller as a customer. If something like this happened from a big company, you will start to, no, I will not use their application. The definitely they will lose. So I'm sure that the company are very careful about the, using the data. Even in my company, we really very careful while we build this kind of application. We do what's called data classification. There's one C1, C2, C3, C4. What should be used uh, for building this kind of application? What we cannot use it. You will see in banks system, they will never ask for an external company to do it for them. They will hire the team internally. So there is a way actually to to avoid this kind of threats. Okay, I hope I, uh, this answered your point to our uh, regarding the question. Back to the, because it's really very interesting discussion. So this it's a track and momentum. So let's say that the AI based application it's data driven application. A traditional application is problem driven. You solve one problem, but using one AI application, you can solve multiple problems. And this is like actually the difference between a single application, which is normal one, and an application, okay, imitate the human brain, for example. You can use your brain for learning, for doing problem solving, and all of this stuff at the same unit, if, if we can say, say it like this. Okay. Is it, is it like a rosy uh, environment or a rosy world to build an AI, AI application? I will not say it's not rosy actually, because the technology itself has been proved. You will see a lot of ML models exist now. Recommendation, prediction, protection, all of this stuff. But it's mainly about how you will introduce them in an application format. Something you, me, everyone will touch the value. For example, YouTube, when you when the normal customer is talking about YouTube, they they didn't talk about any recommendation engine or ML. They're talking about oh my goodness, the prof, the preference or the recommendation become great in 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 YouTube or even Netflix. They didn't understand what's called machine learning or AI. So we need to figure out how we can introduce this kind of application for customer, for end user, and so on. So if I'm if a small company, a startup, or a big company, or even a team who is looking for building an based AI-based application, what should I answer to achieve this successfully? Actually, you need to have a strategy or a vision. Strategy, why you are doing this? What's the problem you are trying to solve? Do you do this like, because I have this time, people came to me, we need to build like machine learning project, why? What's the problem that you are trying to solve? What is the value that you try to generate if it's not exist? So you need to figure out this point. And if we are talking about a big company, this is like to be a good strategy, actually a good vision. Why you are uh, adapt to AI, why? Then you start to talk about or to assess the technology. Is the technology has been proven? Yes, ML, NLB, Computer vision has been proven, so we are not in a bad situation from this side. People, you need to figure out if you have the skill set inside, 
the team inside the startup, inside the organization, how you will get this team? Outsourcing them or build it or like having in-house team process. So are you going to use a traditional way to build this application like waterfall? Or are you going to consume agile? And today in our talk, we will touch the process heavily because design thinking is a process and we will see it later. As I mentioned, you need to have a product roadmap, product vision, a problem definition. All of this need to be defined while you are talking about AI. It's not something, yeah, I wanted to apply machine learning or Or are you, or you, are you going to get this license? Are you going to consume cloud computing? So you need to define this. It's kind of building, such as building like a proposal. Bias, which is really, really big point or important point while you build this proposal. You need to be careful about the data bias, about the model bias, because you, you might have, you might train your, it's actually, if you are going to train your kid to love something, they will be biased to love it forever. If you start to feed them with stuff, how I can say it, not good habits, they will keep doing this. So it's based on how you teach or learn the model. So you need to be careful about the data itself to minimize the bias in data. And I remember one of the use cases that has been published by Google. It's, they try to do um, a tool uh, to do kind of uh, resume um, scanning or like profiling and so on. Uh, you can say CV minor, something like this. And after they publish it, they found it is the solution it's biased because they have trained it to to include the gender. So the algorithm itself start to be biased towards specific gender. So you need to be careful about this. Legality, the thing that you have mentioned in the question, the one that you have mentioned, um, Frank or Abdullah, you have mentioned yeah about this kind of data and privacy, data privacy, data awareness, who should access this data, what is the privilege, uh, all of this stuff, who can own this data, who can, what, what, yeah, what is the, um, how I can say it, if you have this data, you are you eligible to use it for multiple projects or only for, for building one project? If you remember one of the biggest um, or common application that I have, um, I'm not sure if I have mentioned at the beginning or not, it's an application to collect photos of people or images, then it uh, protects your age uh, or your photo after uh, 50 years or something like this. So, okay, how much your data will be used for other applications? So this kind of application, Joe, you need to be careful about using them. So, because you, don't, you, you do not know. Uh, if your data will be used or consumed for for another uh, application which might be illegal or something like this this kind of aspect need to be considered while you are working in building the ai based application i sure. just a quick question on, on that note uh so this is sort of an ai based application but how do you know if you're starting a startup so the, there are students in the chat that are working on companies um if they're working on a startup how do they know whether their startup is destined to be an AI based startup or sh could be augmented with AI or because you said that there's, there's there's a lot of cases where you just ask why why would you want to use machine learning for this project it doesn't make sense but what are the factors that mean that it, it would make sense or it wouldn't make sense to use AI in a project what are you looking for when you're you're thinking machine learning could really help here it's really another very good question, Joe, because this is what we are going to cover in the process. How the design thinking can help you to articulate and understand the business problem from the beginning. So you will invest your effort, time, cost in the right direction. So if I, if you allow me, I, I will keep this question and I will answer it during next slide. Thank you. So moving to we today, we we will focus in the process. Okay how we can consume design thinking to tackle the point that has been mentioned by Joe and other points. I will share them with you. But before that, I need to talk about AI application lifecycle because everything requires steps to achieve it. Whatever, normal application, traditional application, or even AI-based application. First thing you wanted to do, Joe, understanding your problem. It's called problem articulation. Define, the, identify the data. A lot of use cases coming to me and say, we need to apply machine learning, but do you have the proper data to achieve this? Does this re problem require actually machine learning algorithms? Because 
this algorithm is a set of complex algorithms. So we need to be careful when you are using them, you need to achieve a value from something actually complex and will take a time, even money to do it. Then you need to measure the value that came from doing this and the cost that you are going to pay. So this is the first thing that you need to know what's called problem understanding. You need to problem identification. What are the data set that I have to solve this problem? And I need to have a rapid prototyping. I need to have a problem uh, prototyping. This is what is called the design phase. So we are designing. So some, I, I used to mention this actually example. When you are, are going to, um, to pick up a suit or a dress for, um, for something, for uh, you wanted to attend like an, uh, an important appointment, and you wanted to uh, to have this unique thought or uh, or or dress. You are going to for a fashion center and ask them, yeah, I need to have this model. I like uh, mock-up in, in their way and so on. So they are doing designing before giving you the end product. Am I correct? Or you are going to say, no, I, I will get this dress and go. You will not pick up the right dress or the so suitable suit or the thing that you are aiming to have to be more stylish, to, to be more unique and with, how I can say, cheap at the same time, with less time. All of this uh, objective you want to achieve. So it is like the main actually important that came from the design phase. Then you came to the development. Okay, I agree. This actually application uh, will require machine learning algorithm and most probably it will be a prediction model. So, okay, and I have the data set to do it. So how I, how I going to migrate this data? I used to say for the students, the data in, in life world or in business, we do not have data set on Kaggle website to have them. We actually try to figure out how we will get the data from source to destination, from the ser servers with this security and this data privacy and all of this stuff to put it in, in the development environment so the data scientists can start the development. All of this kind of aspects is related to do data management, how we can build this data governance, how we can have a proper data modeling and data catalog. And this touches the question regarding data uh, privacy and so on. Then, the easiest actually phase of this uh, life cycle is the model development. Guess what? Because it's like the fact that all of students are focusing on having an experience in, on top of it, but it's really the easiest one among these phases, the model development. And then we have, I can say, the third difficult phase, which is called the model consumption. As I mentioned at the beginning, people don't care about what you are using behind YouTube application. So you want it to feel the feature, touch it, and get the benefit from it. So you need to be careful. Okay, how I can present this model for customer? Is it web-based application? Is it mobile application? Is it a chatbot-based application or what? So you need to figure out the, how you will consume, how you will deploy this model, how you will keep monitoring, monitoring this model performance, how you can optimize it because it's non-linear process. It's not one day process, you will done it one time, sorry, one time process, you will done it, uh, you will do it one time and that's it. You, you will keep this continual uh, enhancement or improvement. Today, or this hour, I just wanted to share with you this quote with, uh, uh, by Nelson, his partner, ISG Research, and he mentioned uh, that executives who promote design thinking in their organization can accelerate AI adoption, achieve organization alignment, and drive commitment to their goals. So do you remember goals? It's like strategy while reducing resistance in organizational change. So we are talking about culture. So spreading the design thinking inside your team or among your team or organization startup, it's a culture. So, and this culture would help you to build it quickly when market Time to, when I say market, I'm, I'm talking here about time to market. And this is really important. Minimize the cost because the cost of building this kind of application is really expensive comparing them to normal or traditional application. So this like quote, you might, yeah, it might be interesting to hear. So what is design thinking? Oh my goodness, I used to do this mistake and present the solution before uh, or answer before the question. So I would like to ask you a question. What is design thinking? 
will. I can jump in there. Let's uh, let's have a think. Design thinking. I guess it's a process of development within a company that puts the may perhaps puts the design before the necessarily before the outcomes. Uh, maybe you're you're focusing solely on the sort of um, the initial design phase of a, of, a, of a project and and the quirks that come with that rather than looking at the the end product. But I don't know. That's just a guess. Yeah, it's a good point, actually, Joe. Thank you. And I can put it, I will just articulate what you have mentioned in this way that the design thinking is like a methodology. It's like a way. Why? Why need it? To actually build this kind of innovative, innovative application or product, but not focusing in the problem itself, focusing in the customer needs. So we are saying that design thinking is a human centric methodology. So you bring the customer at the same table, you bring the development team and they, you are put them, you put them together to ideate, to, de to design with you. And you have directly and wasting weeks and weeks and weeks in developing something and this suddenly, no, the customer will say, no, I didn't want this actually. It's not my uh, requirement. So you need to have this kind of rapid prototyping to share it with the customer to get their feedback and you will see this actually happening from the industry itself you you will see actually facebook google big companies start to get user feedback with different way it's like a kind of design thinking methodology a way of thinking if you can say it like this you can adjust it to use it in different way so uh, Frank Wang says that design thinking prioritizes a structured strategic approach to design. Is that roughly correct, do you think? A structured. Me, and... Yeah, I will get back to Frank. Design thinking prioritizes structured strategic approach to design. This is one of the things that came from using design thinking. So I will give you the big umbrella definition. Okay. Yeah, allow me and this one, because I'm not the one who put this actually science. It's a science. I will share with you the history behind it after this one. Design thinking is a methodology or a way of attacking a business problem that start from the customer perspective. Not only, no, I want to apply machine learning. Why you need to apply machine learning? Do we have customer need this machine learning application? You think <laughs> based on the customer need, not only solving a business problem. So you start to transform your mindset from focusing in the business perspective, no, you are focusing to at the same time, okay, what the end user need from this application, from this product, from this service, and so on. Cool. Okay, why design thinking? As mentioned by you, actually, though, as mentioned by Frank, it's a way, methodology to do a problem solving. So we can use design thinking for enhance the problem solving. Yes. You can use it like a methodology for do a proper brainstorming. Why? Because you bring all of the team personas at the same table and they start to share, but they are some methodology because it doesn't make sense to keep bring people, people and put them at the same table and that's it. No, there is kind of procedure to get the value from it. It's a process and we will talk about it. You can achieve what's called a rapid idea prototyping and here it's came the design thinking for AI because it do it does actually what we, what you have mentioned Joe it does like rapid prototyping of the idea before saying this design this will be machine learning or even virtual reality or other technology and you can build an end to end or new design product design design using design thinking or enhance an existing product I mean, enhance the design of existing code. Then we will move to the design thinking process. To achieve this methodology, I need process, I need steps. Okay. I, my grandmother learned me from, <laughs> actually learned me a bit good. If you wanted to solve a problem, you need to identify the problem. You need to know where is the problem, actually, to be able to solve it. Don't, don't, don't focus on the solution if you do not understand the problem properly. And this actually our, if all of us, all of the human, sometimes we are focusing in, in solving a problem, most probably not that 
right problem to solve it, actually. So the first phase of design thinking process, it's called understanding. How much you are empathetic, how much you are listening and hear the customer voice and, okay, sit down. What do you want? Actually, I need this and this and this. So all the time we are stuck in the business between the customer need and customer want. The customer came to us and say, I want this and this and this. Actually, it will not end up that's not their need. So we need to pick up their need from this conversation. So the first phase, phase of this process is understanding the problem as understanding the customer need. Start to dig dive in identify in understanding the problem. Once you have uh, understanding the problem, you can listing list different points under this problem and you might end up with multiple problem, then you need to pick up the right problem. So we need to pick it to, def to define, to be more constructive and select one problem to work on it. And this pro problem, you can do a prioritization as you have mentioned, Frank, you can use design thinking methodology. One of the activities is how to, how do you uh, do what is called heat map to know, oh, yeah, what is required for customer now. And there is what's called smart, smart goal. It's like um, the smart goal should be measurable, achievable, timeable, and so on. After all of this, you can start ideation. You can then talk about technology. Actually, Joe, you can say, uh, Andrea, yeah, I will use machine learning, might be virtual reality, might be IoT, and so on. You can dream. Keep the same prototyping. It could be like in, in, in a paper, it could be a mock-up via an application, it could be a model up and running, and then you will have the test phase to get a feedback rapid and quick feedback from the customer as much as you can. And this process has been defined by Stanford School and they have actually design school. Uh, I cannot remember the, the data even. Yeah, it seemed that's 1,099, something like this. I would like to put something inaccurate. But it's not like an old process, not something new. I disagree that this process, non-linear process because you you might pick up one problem start to work on this problem do ideation and then oh no this is not the right problem to work on top of it it's not feasible it's not applicable and so on you might reach out the prototype phase and you end up no i need to return back and uh, do ideation again because this prototype is not feasible for example once you for example which is a test phase you might end up, no, I need to do some change in the prototype. I need to return back to ideation and so on. So it's a non-linear process. And Mr. Nelson Norman Group in 2013 has added what's called implement. So you can, after this, do implementation. You can do implementation actually in test phase. It's a part of, uh, you can consider test phase is a part of implementation. I, get, I will get back to um, actually um, YouTube to make sure I'm audible and everything is okay. Okay. So, did you hear about design sprint term before? Tell me if you have heard about this term before. Yeah. You heard about yeah. design thinking. And sprint is common in agile. Yeah. Joe, you have mentioned, yeah. Tell me, what is design sprint? So in software engineering, a design sprint is where you lay out your goals for your the, the sprint, which is usually a four week period, and you set out an objective for the end goal. You dissect the object, you dissect the, the workload into sections, and then you start the sprint and you attempt to finish the work in the sprint, and then you end, you deploy the product. So you, you push the software to live, to production, and then you analyze whether you've met all your goals, you do an analysis of the of the the previous sort of month, and then you move on to the next sprint uh, for your next goals. And it's a sort of way of releasing code into production at staggered rates. Um, that's the context of software engineering. So it might be different awesome. in design thinking. Awesome. Also, actually, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Andre. There's the ahead. agile uh, methodology where you meet every morning and you discuss what you need to do that day and what you've done the day before. Okay. Yes, exactly. Thank you, actually, because you have actually inspired me to give another definition might be today. So design sprint, it's one of the sprints you have done 
uh, when you have a software as you uh, or application, as you mentioned, John, Andrea, I wanted to develop it via agile methodology. We used to have this back look. We have sprint planning and we start to meet daily what's called daily standard and track the development. Correct? OK, but you will end up that you might have started the development phase early without validated the business problem, as we have mentioned. OK, is this what's called design sprint? Yeah, you will actually reserve one of the sprint to be a design sprint. So you will say, yeah, the first sprint, it will be a design sprint, and we will put the team together to do what is to apply design thinking process to do a rapid prototyping and validate the idea and get all of the benefits for, that I have mentioned at the beginning before starting the development. So we, and this has been, term has came from Google in 2018 by an internal team, actually Google Venture. Uh, I, mean, I remember the one who is called Jack Knapp and John. They start to say, fine, we have design thinking, we apply agile, we need to, uh, okay, uh, allocate one week of the design uh, of the sprints, I mean, of this three months sprints, and we, we will name it design sprint. And during the five days, we will do what is called uh, understanding, definition of the problem, and doing an ideation, uh, prototyping, and testing this machine learning model, for example. So you can build and test a prototype in just three or five days. Why design thing, design sprint? Because we have mentioned why design thinking to do rapid prototyping and the same rapid solving big challenges. Big challenge could be, we, we didn't understand the problem. We want to do a prototype. We want to uh, validate the customer input. All of this we can uh, categorize as a big challenge or even creating a new product or improving an existing one. Cool. So just like the process that has been provided by Jack Knapp, it is in every phase. Okay, Asma, cool. I'd like to understand my customer, but can you give me some activities to do with my customer to understand this uh, thing? Yeah, it is a set of activities. So in every day we do a set of activities, we end up with an outcome. So the first day we end up what is called map, second day we do sketching, and fourth day which is called ideation. So we decide which idea we should uh, go through it, and we have prototype. So we will start this kind of uh, prototyping of, of the backup or selected idea, and we have this testing with the customer. It's the same. Okay, fine. That's for good. How we can start then all this like theoretical uh, thing that you are mentioning? It seems that uh, there is something good we can have from design sprint or design thinking. But how we can start? You need to have a team. If you are in a graduation project or even you are in a startup, you need to pick up the team. You need to have this facilitator, someone who is able to run this kind of sprints, facilitate them. Um, you can say the one who, ha who was called design thinking practitioner or facilitator, the one who is responsible to orchestrate the sprint. She or he is not necessary to be aware about technology, aware about machine learning, virtual reality, all of this stuff. They are familiar about the techniques to listen for people, to, um, to run it, to manage it, to handle it, to be a good listener. All of this stuff um, is not necessary to be uh, um, this technical person. And if you are a technical person, it will be good, but sometimes you need to control your, yourself from intervention and giving your opinion sometime. Because I have this kind of habit, I try to change it, to be honest, while I'm working with the team. So you, you will bring the designer, you will bring the development team, as I mentioned, data scientists, data, all of them with the customer. They, we will, all of us, will, we will do what is called problem understanding and so on. Okay. Set the stage, define what you are going to do. Bring the people, but you need to identify what you are going to do with, with these people. So you need to have these people who can decide, So such as like product owner persona, or someone who is a lead, or someone like the, your doctor who will, who will, how I can say, supervise in your graduation project, and so on. And you will end up with have this brain team and schedule extra expert. As much as you have expert, you will, you can test your idea, you can test your problem, you can do it early. And definitely, as I mentioned, pick up a facilitator. Don't forget to block five full days from people time. 
because hey, hey come on guys we we are here to to brainstorm we are here to think together Sprint supplied if we are, if we are on site definitely we'll have some kind of sticky note whiteboard and all of this stuff but if we are online you will find a lot of online whiteboards uh, like Miro, like uh, Storyboard, a lot of them, even Zoom itself contains kind of this tools. You need to have a timer, you need to control the time very carefully as a facilitator. You need to have video conference to like whatever, meet, Zoom, and so on. Okay. Let's talk more about the activities that we are doing in every phase. I guess we have around 10 managers, so we can cover these activities and get a question from people. So first day, we will do introduction. If I'm going to, for example, um, I will give you an example. Here we have this data set inside the organization, and one of the manager came to me, Asma, we have this kind of data volume. We need to get a benefit from it. Can you run the design sprint to identify a problem on top of this data? Okay, fine. Then you, you start to work with this person who, who, is called, who is called business owner. I am talking with him. I'm discussing with him what he, he wanted to achieve from this design sprint. I identify the goal of the design sprint. Then I identify with him the tool and the team, all of these things, and we start to work together. So, okay, work together to do what? Let's do this. First thing, you need to define the long-term goal from this sprint. Give us an example. Please be optimistic. But the team, we start to play together. Everyone will get some sticky notes, and it's like a silent activity, giving them like 10 minutes. Guys, start to brainstorm and give me 10 ideas uh, to achieve a benefit, a benefit from this data, on top of this data. By the way, they will get an access on, on top of this data during the work or during the sprint, and they do what's called navigation on top of this data. Someone will ask me, Asma, but we have UX and UI designer. Um, is this persona capable to give? Yeah, I want people to dream. Listen, there is no stupid idea. So you need to be a good listener if you want to be a good facilitator. Listen to the people. When the best ideas came from non-technical people. So let's say the long-term goal, yeah, we need to have this kind of a mobile application to predict the customer behavior inside my organization, for example, to increase uh, blah, 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 blah. Another goal and so on. We start to vote and we have this decider to define which goal we will go through it. We have the business owner. We have all of these people to decide early. So we start to identify or understand actually our problem. If you have any question, please bring them. Or stop me if I'm saying something I'm, um, irreasonable. Okay, thank you. Then moving to the thing that people love it more, getting pessimistic. When you tell people, okay, we want to build uh, this kind of application on top of this data, people will say, but we do not have a good data scientist. We do not have a team. We do not have a tool. Okay, people, can we change our way of, of describing the problem and say how we can get a good data scientist, how we can have the proper tools, how we can increase the budget or having this budget. So we start to propose a question to solve the problem more than saying there is a problem. And here we are talking about changing people's mindset. It's not easy. I used to take to run this activity twice to change the people way of thinking, if you go to tell me. Then you have this kind of persona. We define what are the persona that we need in this project, or sorry, who need, who we need in this project. Data engineer, data scientist, DevOps, solution architect, customer, end user, all of them. And this persona will be different from one project to another. It depends. A normal application, or if you are not saying, no, we, we are not targeting to build an AI application from the beginning, definitely will not need a data scientist. Because in our proposal, we have started with data. Then you need to build what is called map. You have defined, for example, Asma, we will build this kind of application using machine learning to do 
um, an interactive and online learning platform. So who, who is going to consume or access this platform? We have learner, we have admin, we have teacher, blah, 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 blah. This like kind of person. And we have the development team, like a data engineer who will develop. You start to put all of the personas at the, right, at the left side. You put your objective or long-term goal at the right time. Or, sorry, at the right side. So, for example, learn what the learner will get from this application. Uh, yeah, I wanted to sign up, to log in, to search for a course, to register, to auto researching, or to come, or to uh, how I can registration, uh, do this kind of profiling, uh, do recommendation for the courses that I can get it based on my historical data and so on. This is called the map. So you can draw the map such as like um, on, if you are on site and you are running um, an on site design sprint, you'll end up with, by using this kind of whiteboard. Or you can use uh, some, uh, as I mentioned, Miro or Storyboard to draw this like visual uh, online. Um, okay, cool. Do not forget to ask the experts. Once you have defined long term goal, define the sprint question, draw the map ask the expert, get back to the business owner, get back to the doctor who is responsible or guide you during the graduation project, get back to a team or test user, something like this. There is a different way to define the expert based on the application that you are going to develop. Don't forget to run activities called how might we. How might we, so one of the business, the sprint question was, Okay, how we can get a clever data science team? So how might how might we achieve this? So someone will say, okay, we will build it inside. We will hire people. Our we will hire the one data scientist. This one of ideas for of the ideas, for example. We will hire one data scientist. We will hire we will hire data engineer. So what else? What else? For example, Joe, in your mind, if if we have defined the problem, our the sprint question, how we get a clever data science team? Give me three ideas now. How do we get a clever data science team once we've defined the problem? So it, I, I think the, the crux of this problem for me is uh, in my sort of experience of working with startups, you have different resources than big companies like Vodafone. So I think the, the situation would be different in those contexts. I think if you're working at Vodafone and you need data scientists, um, probably all of the best data scientists will want to work for you anyway. So you could you could go and find them in, uh, in the universities. There are students, for example, at societies um, that are 22, 25, that are keen to get involved in, in these big projects. So I would definitely look at sort of, I would personally look at uh, these groups of, of people that are passionate, they're passionate enough to go and start a society or, or be involved in a society. So whether it's, um, you know, student members at Entrepreneurship Society or, or Data Science Society or um, Work AI. Um, that's where I'd find my data scientist, but I think the strategy depends on uh, whether you're a big company like Vodafone or a startup, because you have to do different tactics. Yeah, so this is like a kind of, of thinking, if, if if we can say it, it's like this kind of ideas, I need them. So if I ask the same question to um, Andrea, so give me like an example or some ideas to build this kind of team. Yeah, so I think as Joe said, the largest uh, resource for us student entrepreneurs or for startups are students themselves. They're so willing and they're so keen to, I mean, I know that myself, I would jump at any opportunity from a startup to work for them. And if I was a data scientist and that was something that is, uh, um, that is searched and uh, the companies want, then yeah, I think students are a very large untapped potential. Exactly. This is what I wanted to hear today, that I will ask the question during the sprint. I will get different ideas from different perspectives. We put them together. We start to vote. We start to assess our situation. Like we are startups, so we need to, okay, we need, we need to know our limits or constraints. As you mentioned by Joe, we might know, we, not like Vodafone, to reach out the best candidate. So we might uh, rely on the students. We might re rely on internship, something like this. Different ideas. So this is what's called how might we, and you, you imagine, I remember one of the activities or one of the questions we have answered during the design sprint and we get around one more than 100 ideas. We start to categorize them together and some of them tackle the process, some of them tackle the 
uh, people side and so on. So we need to organize how might we, but as a facilitator, don't care about this categorization. The ideas will categorize themselves. Once you have these ideas, this is like the, the job that you need to focus in finishing it as a facilitator. Don't forget about voting. And we try to push people to vote for other ideas if they are good, because we are, we are human. Sometimes we say, yeah, my idea, why you didn't vote for my idea? Why are my idea is not good? We are human. So start, start to break this ice between people to vote for other people ideas and and not get this or something like this it's really important because we are human once you have drawn this map you start to do what's called research lighting demo and hi guys go ahead and do search about this kind of idea problems that we have defined in the map please go ahead and do provide me some demos and do the proper research and get back to me. And this is what's called lightning demo, doing the research and so on. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I will just go through, through this section uh, quickly, just five minutes, yeah, more. So this you will see this like is a view of lightning demo. I will go in the part for part section, and we it's called for part because it's based for uh, paper uh, in in a four size. If I can say it like this, we start to draw uh, what we are talking about it. Then you will come to the story part, um, and here we do what's called ideation about finding a solution. How we can how we can do this recommendation? How the application will look like, and all of this stuff. We start to build story port and do user test flow. It's like an, I'm doing it a heat map. I'm I'm, I'm just do, I will go through them quickly. This is like how the vote, voting looks like. It's like the user test flow. When there's a user will came and test our application, what is the happening? They will sign up, sign in, search, and so on. This is what's called user test flow, and this is how the story uh board look like. If you can see, it's like Joe here. I will assume here we have Joe will open the application, what Joe will, will see. When he uh, open YouTube, what he will see, this kind of story board. And everyone in the team draws this story board and do, we are doing um, a voting of the best story board. And this like in the prototype, this kind of funny, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you are going to apply it on site, we'll get, you will be enjoyed. It's really joyful activity. We start to draw as if we are drawing mobile application, for example, as if you are drawing YouTube application. The prototyping could be via a Figma tool to build what's called digital prototype, or it could be paper-based, or it could be mock-up, it could be uh, the model on top of the data via Excel sheet, and so on. It depends. And finally, you will have the test. Is to test it, is to actually prototype. Actually, how much successfully uh, successful the big company? They, they do testing all the time. If you can see the product way of, of Facebook, you will you will see them? They are okay. Develop this thing and publish it and get the user feedback quickly. But you cannot do this in all all of the kind of application. You can do it in some use cases, but in some uses. And you cannot rely, you need to be careful sometimes. Do not forget to, to get the notes from uh, the customer, from the tester, to and try to work on them. As I mentioned, it's a non-linear process. Just, I want to put this thing in front of you. This design thinking is a human-centric process. But while we are building AI, we most probably are, we are focusing a machine. And when you are integrate them together, you understand that we are focusing in machine and human uh, at the same time. Yeah, we wanted to build AI-based application. If you are a startup, I wanted to, you wanted to kick off this AI or this era, but you need to focus on the customer, generate a new value for the customer, or um, enhance uh, an existing. I will stop here. Actually, no. Thank you, everyone. I wanted to stop talking too much to listen to me. My voice is really my be. Uh, not that uh, funny today. So. <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you so much. I uh, can't be. I can't lie that I, I didn't know a lot about that sort of design philosophy before the talk. But I um, I feel like I know a little bit more about it now. And we're going to write up your uh, your talk into a, a post on our website. So we'll have a sort of overview of design thinking if you're thinking about applying it to 
uh, if anyone out there is trying to apply it to one of their projects. So do you think that this, uh, this sort of design philosophy is applicable to small scale projects that are done with, say, a, a small team of three people? Or is it just sort of in big businesses or maybe startups that have funding? No, actually, it's it came to 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 tackle this challenge. You know, the team that they do not have this fund, they do not have this big team. They can rely on design thinking to have this kind of rapid prototyping. Otherwise, if you have X budget to invest it in in building a product, and you have invested it in in this big actually project, or in in the design um, phase. You might be all this money, but but let me put it in, in a different way because, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking in something else, Joe. If you have this big company and they are they try to uh, build this big solution, definitely they will put a big budget. Are you staying with me? Yeah. So if you are going to assign a small amount of this budget for design sprint, it will minimize uh, how I can say it. Uh, the lose if you are going to invest the whole budget in the project development directly. Sure. This one perspective. Another perspective, if you are a small startup and you have this X amount and you want to go to, to market, are you going to do a risk and do the development directly? And there is a risk, it might be not successful or just will save a small amount and do kind of small prototyping because the prototype guess what you you are it's not necessary to follow the four, the five process you might end up just doing the prototyping because you are fully aware about the business problem so for example you have small data set you will bring small data set you will test just the model on top of this data set to do what's called proof of value or proof of concept and yeah. how that Yes, and this is how the design sprint could help you to achieve what is called proof of value, proof of concept. Sometimes you need to how I can say it, convince customer to give you this actually investment. So you need to show them something. So design thinking will help you to do this. Hope yeah. this answers the question. Yeah, as a startup, you kind of have this choice. Like, do you run out of money first, or do you run out of time first, and you have to this careful balance that you need to take care of like yeah you could put all your money into one big design sprint that might give you the perfect product or you can phase it out but risk getting uh exactly. out competed or getting thrown out of the market by competition that is bolder or braver than you yeah and this was for time to market yes time exactly. to market. really important yeah, but if you if you hurry and you waste all your budget in a month, then that's also not good. Yeah, this is what we have learned in the business now, to be honest. And I, I used to say nothing is really 100% correct and nothing 100% wrong. Yeah, of like course. Disease. So, you have to find the balance. Exactly. Okay, so should I move to uh, people question uh, in chat? Uh, so, yeah. We can we can do that if you would like to. Uh, if you can see any, I think there's one by Chris Bermo there um, that says. Yeah, I live in Chinese. Let me tell you that my name is, is Asma Ibrahim, so you can say AI. Another <laughs> name, just a joke. <laughs> uh, Chris Bermo wants to know what is the best way to understand your audience and problem, which was one of the sort of initial steps of the design thinking strategy. It's a really good question because you can tackle this by what's called user interview, user research, uh, doing what is called surveys. There's a lot of ways to collect user input. And the best one of them actually to do user interview. If you can do it with someone clever to read uh, in between lines, you will find, um, you will get actually uh, a good input from the customer. And you will find the technology itself can help you to do this. Let me change the title of this session and say AI for design. Come on, ask me what you are saying. It's crazy. No, it's not crazy. Do you remember this application that I have mentioned to grab photos, people, and give you the, the, your age after 50 years? Uh -huh. yeah. It's a way of getting user data, getting user feedback. It's a smart way using the technology. So the technology itself now is used to get the user feedback and user input 
and start to understand what the customer will need after five years. Fantastic. There was a question in chat from Frank. Uh, he says, one of the points you mentioned earlier was that one of the biggest problems we're dealing with now is biased data. I was wondering, or Frank was wondering, in fact, what is there to say that AI is biased and not truly reflective of the population? And if there is a bias that you found, if you're able to identify one, then how do you minimize this bias in your data sets? Okay, cool. It's a really good question because there is now algorithm, machine learning algorithm has been built on top of this data to detect the bias. Okay. So the data bias, there is a different category of data bias. Data bias should, could be came from confirmation. Someone start to pick up some data sets because we are human, we have preference, or we have picked up the wrong data set or the data is not clear, or we have included some sensitive data that make a bias in the model later, as I mentioned, such as gender and so on. All of this kind of bias, you can even define them by practice using a clever data scientist because the data scientist or data engineer can do this task, this analysis, or you can rely on the technology itself because this kind of business has been started to build a machine, learn, machine learning model to detect the bias in the data. That's it. Just to detect the bias in the data. Yeah. I have a question. So this is less of a practical question, but it's more a question of looking into the future. like. Um, like many other fields before, AI is like really advancing at the moment and we're going to new places every day and we're reaching new heights every day. It's, I mean, what do you think governments sh should do? Should they regulate AI development? Should they um, leave it be as it is? Do you think it should run its course or should there be some sort of guidelines in place? To be honest, I will tell you that my my opinion will not make any sense in this world because the adaption of AI will happen. If you if you can, it's it's like how I can say it. It's a power of economy. How much is the economy settled around the world? Is it managed by government and sector, or is it managed by uh, private sector such as big companies and so on? But this will, how I can say it, um, do you remember uh, this debate between uh, Facebook and Elon Musk from uh, Tesla? They start to build what is called open AI or, or open group or AI for good. Recently, actually, Elon Musk has left this group. Because, mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is kind of good benefit you can have from AI. What we need to have this kind of, uh, how I can say, it? this is a non-profit organization to push to have a data privacy laws such as GDPR. Do you remember when GDPR has started? It has been yeah, started I think after, yeah, tell me. Two years ago, I think. Yeah, why well, it has been started after an, an incident has been done related to data violation. I don't uh, know. Yeah, it's related to Facebook case, if you if you mm -hmm. what I mean. Has been they start to, to have a California actually data regulation and we have now GDPR uh, regulatory and I expect to have more uh, uh, more laws came regarding the data privacy and so on. But I think technology beyond the regulation. Mm -hmm. If you go to what uh, I mean. You yeah, think but, that AI will advance either way, even if the government says no or says go ahead, AI will advance because it's in demand. Yes, no one can control any application. If you are going to consume any application now, no one will, can limit you from using it. The government yeah. might collect them data because they accept it. So how, how the government is it? So we, actually, I used to say uh, people learn people their rights I, for this reason, I have started my startup. It's for learning kids AI, how, how they protect themselves during the AI era. So you can protect people by learning them, the good and that side of things. And they can start, uh, you can select. Not all things can come their rules, to be honest, and laws. Uh, this might, might, might be wrong or not. I'm not sure, to be honest. Could you uh, give us a brief overview of your, uh, just as the final question, could you tell us more about your startup and what's the name of it and where people could find yeah, out Thank more? you for asking me this. It's called Siba and it's like for some, it's a name from uh, old civiliz Egyptian civilization. It means star and actually it's mainly uh, for learn learning design thinking and as a methodology for kids and 
providing some data privacy, how they pr can protect their data during the AI era and all of this stuff. I mean, it's for kids because I, I see how much the kids are using and they are proposing for, for using an online application, online platform and learning. So we need to give them um, awareness about the good side and not not good side of the technology sure even if it is just for kids it might be interesting for for everyone to look at or to show their little brothers or their, their kids in the future or something how did you spell that name uh as a, how did you how Sipa? Did you, yeah how do you spell it it's s-e-p for pop e s-e-p-a okay fantastic yeah. So I'm going to, I think that's a good point to draw an end to the discussion. Um, I want to say thank you so much, Asma, for, for coming and, and giving us a talk on design thinking. Just before we go, just a few things. Uh, the first thing is the giveaway. So we were running it, we're running a giveaway in every event here. And um, we were going to give away the, the, the prize based on your favorite comment. So if I just give you a brief rundown of, uh, of the, the comments that uh, people made. Uh, if you tell me your favorite one, then we'll get in touch with them and we'll uh, we'll give away the uh, the merchandise. So you had the theory of and development of uh, so you had the the comment by OJ about the theory and development of computer systems as a definition for AI. Uh, you had uh, Abdullah talking about the dangers of tyrannical governments. We had uh, Frank Wang talking about s uh, secure data and AI storage. Chris Bromo wanted to know more about the audience problem. Uh, we had Frank Wang wanting to know about the bias in data collection. So there are five there for you to, to choose from. Uh, if you let me know your, your favorite, your, 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 the one you enjoyed most, then I will uh, get in touch with them. Yeah, actually it's really yes, difficult, but let me tell you, there is a question you have asked me. I, I cannot remember who, who asked this question. It's about how I can understand my customer or uh, the audience. I oh, fantastic. Remember. So that was uh, Chris. So we'll get in touch with Chris for, uh, for a moment. We'll, uh, we'll let him know. Fantastic. And the second point I wanted to make was that there's another talk happening just after this one. So anybody that's watching this and wants to go and hear another AI talk, uh, we're listening to a researcher called Antonia Cresswell from DeepMind. Uh, so DeepMind is uh, one of the world's largest uh, AI research laboratories. And Tony will be coming to talk to us about fundamental AI research that's going on right now in the sort of sphere of AI. So if you're interested in that, the link is in the description. That will be starting in 40 minutes. So I've got to jump over to that one now. And the second point, third point, sorry, I wanted to make is there's a big Warwick AI discussion going on tonight. So all of the things we've been talking about today uh, are going to be in a sort of accessible format for everyone to come and talk about. So we're going to have be breaking off into sort of splinter rooms and uh, it will be a fun social event. So that's happening at 7 p.m. tonight. So there's a Facebook, uh, pay, uh, Facebook event for that on our page. So with that being said, if that's, uh, that's everything from you, Andre, and uh, as well, I want to say thank you very much to both of you for coming. Thank you to Warwick Entrepreneurship Society for collaborating with us on this event. And finally, thank you, Asma, for taking the time out of your day to come and talk to us about the philosophy of uh, design thinking. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you for the opportunity, Joe, and thank you, Asma, for the incredible talk today. Thank you everyone for inviting me today and best of luck in the coming talks. I will join actually give mind one. Thank you.